your doodle books. You practiced your your thing. How did it feel to go through your book, uh, right hand and then switch? What did that feel like? Well, it feels kind of mm. weird with this one because I never use it, but then gradually I start feeling much better with my lines. I was following much, much better than before. And I felt pretty comfortable. I will do it more and more because I enjoy that. So, but you went doodle, 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 five pages. Now, first thing with your doodle books, I noticed you have like a page each, okay? You could put five or six different oh, doodles on here. There's, they're just supposed to be, you know, like... Like a little song. Yeah, and what are you looking at when you're doing these doodles? I have books. I buy books for my granddaughter so I can... Oh, like how to draw books? Uh-huh. And okay, so little different things that you can enjoy. And enjoy. So there's these little vignettes in here that actually are doodles in themselves. Yes. Um, so they're they teach you how to do the proportions and everything. Yeah, and if if you're not really like uh, secure on the outcome, you know, like if you're not like have a lot invested in the outcome, then the doodle books become actually kind of fun. As long as you don't look at them. And I know somebody in line that said, well, what do you propose we do with the doodle books if we're not supposed to ever look at them again? <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, the best thing to do is to just take the doodle books once you're finished with them and shove them under the bed. And if you keep on doing that and keep on doing it and keep on doing it, you will, yeah, your bed will get higher and higher and higher. But the thing that will happen and this is what I, I uh, typed it back to them because I try to answer everybody who asks me on YouTube questions. Um, so I said, well, just imagine, because you're doing all of these doodles, how well you're going to get. You're going to become a really famous artist. And imagine how much fun it will be to look back at all your doodles at the very beginning. So it's nice to store them. Don't get rid of them. Um, and then I said, once you become famous, just imagine how much money you'll make selling them on eBay. <laughs> Imagine getting Picasso's doodle book when he was just beginning how to paint. I mean, that would be a really awesome thing. So anyway, um, so looking at that. But I really want your doodle books to, I mean, it's good that you find a source like this, but we want to eventually learn how to draw from life. That's really the key that we want to do. So we really want the doodle books to be a representation of something you actually see, not like, you know, a cartoon. Um, we want to develop your drawing ability in the process. Even though we're not putting any intention on the other end that it has to mean anything, these doodle books shouldn't mean anything at all. But we want to look down and look at like this, this, this Coke with the straw in it. And we want to kind of subconsciously kind of be aware that we're trying to render that without anything attached to it. No drawing, no, you know, you're just, you're just going to just like, in fact, what you could do at this point is this is a good time to call one of your relatives who talks a lot. You know, I'm sure all of you have somebody that once that phone rings, you got caller ID and you go, I don't know if I want to, I don't want to talk to them that long. Because you know they'll never shut up. Those are the people that you can catch up with while you're doodling. Because I have found that when I'm busy talking to somebody on the phone, I'm, my mind is really preoccupied. So the left part of my brain is really working with that conversation. And my right side of the brain is doodling. And that's usually when you doodle, is when your left brain is really occupied. Your right brain is sitting there idling. But what you want to do is glance over at something, whatever it is your husband, your dog, your flowers, your something like that, and just kind of mindlessly start to draw it. Because you won't develop that drawing skill. The whole point is we want to get you to become a better drawer without being fearful of learning how to draw or sketch. If you do this enough, eventually the eye-brain coordination, which basically what drawing is, will start to develop. Most people don't develop that because they're too fearful of the, the act of drawing or sketching. So we kind of have to be intentionally. So we are intentionally doodling. We're not just doodling because we need to fill up pages. We're intentionally doodling. And then intentionally, every five pages, we're going to switch to the other hand. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do two or three doodles like that while your brain is occupied on something else. Not curious to see what the outcome is. 
but just to do the act of that. And then go back to the right hand and see whether or not the brain has engaged a little differently with what you're looking at. So it's really crucial. What I felt that it was more fun, the more I practiced, it was that I was doing, watching, you know, looking the, the picture, whatever I want to do it, and I just doing the lines and everything was fine because I just start losing my hand out more. The more I do it, my hand starts getting loose. Mm -hmm. know, so I don't have to stop. And what, is, what do you mean by stopping? Because it's like when you don't flow your hand, you have to stop, right? Yeah. But that's why it was so great that I was watching the picture and I was just doing it without not In what line? stop. Yeah. You were just kind of like being part of the process and, and not, not really, yeah. yeah. See, when, when we're drawing, one of the things with drawing, and if you've ever taken a serious drawing class, and I highly recommend if you're going to learn how to draw, you need to go into a figure drawing class, preferably a nude figure drawing class, even though a lot of people have this really weird thing about having somebody naked, but that's their problem. It's not really anything that's that's anything. It's kind of like there's a weird obsession with somebody being naked if you're obsessed by that. But anyway, if they just sit there and pose and you draw them, um, the key to, to learning how to draw is first you'll learn gesture drawing and you draw the gesture. And if you go to a gesture drawing class, the first 30 minutes they do 20 second gestures. And the model poses and then poses again and poses again. And if you've never drawn before, you go, holy smoke, how do these people draw so fast? Um, but what they're doing is they're loosening you up. And then what they do is they'll find a gesture. And they'll stay there for 15 or 20 minutes. And then the whole key is to keep your eye on the model, not on your drawing. Which is very, very difficult. Now I studied from a fabulous art teacher by the name of Casey Fitzsimmons up in San Francisco. She believed that you didn't have to know um, anything about the anatomy to learn how to draw. She says that everything that you need to know about drawing is right there in front of you. She said that, you know, knowing the anatomy underneath the skeleton of a 300 pound woman isn't really going to benefit the drawing at all. You're going to have to learn to draw what you see. The problem that we have is that we spend a lot of time looking at our drawing and not a lot of time looking at the model. The key to really drawing well is to be able to keep your eyes on the model and not on your drawing. So one of the exercises that we do is that we do contour drawing, which is where you draw the outside of the figure. And we have pages in front of our drawing and we hold the pencil like this. And I cover up the drawing itself. So I'm totally not preoccupied by my drawing at all. So let's just assume this straw is my pencil and you're my model. And I go underneath here because I can't, I know I'm gonna cheat. You know, it's like, I just cheat. I'm just that kind of guy. <laughs> Good to know that, right? Okay. So, um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to draw you like this. Now, what's the benefit of that? I am not concerned with this. I'm more concerned with getting my, my brain into the model and learning how to activate my arm here, the final drawing isn't that important. In fact, when you look at your final drawing, it's kind of hideous. <laughs> but the thing is, it's a practice. If you do that a lot of times, you can actually become really good at drawing that way. And before you know it, you're going to be spending time just looking at something, doodling. And that's basically what the doodle is. Our attachment to sketches is that we sit there, we sketch, and then we judge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we go. Mm -hmm. Rip it out again. Yeah, well, that's, that's another thing. Yeah, like, and then you go, damn, I can't draw. <laughs> so the only thing I can draw is flies, right? Anyway, so, so this is good. So you're, you're doing good on your doodle books. You want to be sure that you do that. You want to mindlessly be doodling by just looking at something, doodling, keeping your, your, your mind on something else while you're doing that. Um, try to look from real objects, not out of books, um, and try to do them as fast as possible. Do several on a page. Every five pages, switch hands, do a page of that, four or five drawings, go back to your drawing, and you'll see that pretty soon you'll start getting really good. You'll be amazed at how good you'll get.
It's all about practice. The problem is we don't practice enough. If we were in a music class, we would be doing scales. Da 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 da. Anybody that teaches music doesn't start off with Beethoven's fifth on the first day. It starts you off with really simple things. And if you make mistakes, the great thing about playing music is that when you make a mistake, it's gone. It just disappears. The only thing it affects is your ego, but in a very short way. Paintings last forever. Drawings last forever. It's like three years from now, you're fearful that your drawing's going to pop up while you're cleaning your closet going, ah, you can't draw. <laughs> So you want to be sure that you um, uh, practice, 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 practice. <coughs> yeah. So do you recommend to draw with your uh, book closed somewhere? If, if you find that you're too attached to, the, to what you're drawing, if you're like judging what you're drawing, I mean literally when the drawing is done, turn the page, turn the page. Don't look back, to move forward, move forward, move forward, fill up books, fill up books. You have to get better you have to get better. If you find that you are um, stumbling or judging, or it's, then cover the page up, put a page over it and, and draw like that. It is not important on the outcome. What's important is the practice. The problem is with most artists is that we don't practice enough. We focus too much on the outcome and put too much effort into that and we don't practice. Now a lot of students want to learn how to practice. I mean they want really loose brush strokes but they're so fearful of doing that they're so fearful of breaking through the barriers that they start off going like Jean today. You know, I said, just kind of wipe it in like that. Just go for it, you know, because at the beginning of the painting is when the only time you're gonna be free enough to put it in. So you have to be really uh, willing to allow whatever happens, happens. And then trust that you'll pull it together. If you learn how to uh, uh, get your eye hand coordination working, then you'll be able to learn how to draw eventually. Okay, so it's just practice. Do you finish a painting in one sitting when you paint? I finish an idea. You know, like um, this, this week I started a painting uh, about nine o'clock at night, and it was a goat, a mountain goat, standing on top of a cliff with a waterfall, kind of one of my normal things that people like. And um, I paint the whole thing seriously for like two hours in one sitting. And I mean, it is like in. When I'm done and I leave, everything's in. The whole painting, the lighting, the shadows, the thickness of the paint, the, the texture, that part of the painting. And even like I'm doing a large commission piece of, of the first, you know, it's a 36 by 48 canvas, I think it is. Uh, 36 by 40, no, it's 36, by, anyway, it's large. But I do the first thing, I could cover that canvas in one sitting, so it takes me about three or four hours. And then it's months of work into it, you know, and it's all of the little stuff that takes a lot of time. But the painting, really, when you're done, a lot of people would say, that's done, that's finished. But I'm much more of a detailist, I like working into a painting. Um, so I try to get in as much as I can at the beginning of the painting. Now if I'm doing something like a study and the flower is going to die, then I have to be done with the painting in a couple hours. So you have to learn how to develop that very quickly. These kind of gesture drawing, doodle books and stuff will help you with that. It will help you kind of not be attached to every line and you start putting in lots of lines that don't matter and eventually those lines will start adding up to a line where the painting finally comes together. Okay. Where's your doodle book? Did you do one? I did one. I didn't get all the way through. But you don't have to get all the way through. You just have to get how many pages do you do? About three, I think. Three pages. How many how many how many drawings per page? Two, I think. Okay. Three drawings per page at least. And this week you're going to do at least 25 pages. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Holy tamale! I'm telling that to I'm when I throw it out there, it's going across the room. Okay. So next week's homework assignment is is three on a page, 25 pages. Every five page, switch your dominant hand. Okay.
Any questions? You cannot cut yes. corners on practicing. Bougereau, who's really quite famous for doing beautiful portraits, and his portraits of, of women and children and angels and stuff, they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. But he has been known to spend six hours, six hours prior to him painting on a painting, working on hands and feet. Just drawing hands and feet for six hours. And then he would go to his easel and start painting. Most of you don't put six hours in a week. And he'd put six hours before he would put in his hours of painting. And he produced a lot of paintings that were phenomenal and detailed. But he felt like in order for him to be a master at being able to recreate the human figure, and especially for what he wanted, because he would have these wonderful angels flying in the, in, the, in the sky and interacting with women and, you know, all of this. And the women would be pushing angels back saying, I don't want any love or anything, you know, like, like Cupid. He's got one of Cupid, his arrow. And the woman's like going, no, don't you dare. I don't want that arrow. And, you know, but the thing is, Cupid's got his cute little feet floating in the air and his little nails and all that. And she's pushed him back in such a way that you can see the skin just... Bending in, you can see Cupid is determined to, to, to get this done because it's his job. And she's pushing back. And it's wonderful. But in order to do that, you've got to practice. Some of you are just amazing. When you come to class, you think, you know, oh, I should be able to do that right now. It's like, no. If you want to be a great portrait artist, you have to practice. If you want to be a good drawer, you have to practice. If you want to be a good painter, you have to practice. If you want your paintings to be loose, you got to practice. you got to practice to the point that you're not concerned about what you're doing anymore. Where it's just second nature. You can't hand somebody a saxophone and say, here, play. It's your solo. If they don't even know how to blow in it. You have to practice. And at some point, you'll be able to play your solo. But you've got to practice. You know, when you really want to, you take your books everywhere. I took them in the car. I took them everywhere. It, yeah. it just made it more... Well, I had students ending up, you know, putting a string around their books. And then, you know, it got kind of to the point where the husbands got involved. So like the husband would say, we're going to go see the game. Did you bring your doodle book? <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing. You want, to, you want like your guests to th sit there and think, how rude. We're having dinner and she's out doodling, <laughs> you know. As, I, mean, when, I mean, but think about it. If you were actually sitting with an artist and they were drawing, Imagine if you were sitting with Leroy Neiman for dinner, and he's sitting there drawing on his, on his uh, napkin or whatever like that. You're saying to yourself, when he's done, I'm picking that napkin up. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not rude. In fact, a lot of people will admire that you are able to do that, but it's so much more easier not to do something. So making doodle books part of your life by hanging them around your neck, putting them in your purse, you should have a doodle book. One of my, one of my doodle books that I took when I went to the Grand, not to Colorado, to Mesa Verde, the doodle book that I took there that was instrumental in me doing my first plein air painting that absolutely rocked, was a doodle book that was bound in leather, very beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, thick. The little one. Thick like this, and it was two inches by one inch. Little, tiny, tiny, and I kept it right here. And it was this thick, wonderful paper, beautiful bound. It was like a little tiny Bible, if you can imagine. And I had saw Mesa Verde, and I said, oh, I can't do that. And sure enough, I was just like totally defeated. And I said, no, wait a minute. So I went to the Mexican restaurant, got a margarita, started doing these little, tiny, tiny doodles in this book. And I thought, you know, I could do this. I really could. If I go early enough, and if I'm intentional enough, I could really organize. And I had a whole conversation. It's amazing what conversations you can have with two or three margaritas going. <laughs> no, these were blue margaritas. I'd never had them before, and they were wonderful. So anyway, that kind of got me the nerve. But the thing is, had I not had my doodle book, and I was like processing all these drawings, I would have probably have driven off from Mesa Verde not even doing a plein air painting. So it's really, really crucial to have these drawing books and have them in such a way that you can carry them, even if they're that small. If you have to have them that small, if you have to fit them in a pouch, then that's what you're going to do to make them happen. Okay?